Well, hello, everybody. Today, I wanted to address the question of whether or not slavery gave rise to capitalism. Now, this is uh, a query that I haven't actually had asked that many times. It's not something that I've encountered, and I've never heard of other people encountering it with any great regularity of all the many um, topics and questions that come into debate. Usually, when questions about slavery and libertarianism um, are brought about, it's almost always in the context of you know, how is libertarianism going to prevent slavery and isn't slavery somehow a, a good indication of why we need government to rectify problems, that sort of thing. Um, the idea, though, that slavery gave rise to capitalism uh, or the free market is, is is an accusation that I don't hear that, that often. Um, and it came from kind of an unusual source. Uh, I was well, on a date, let's just say that, in Boston with a a Harvard teacher, uh, a sociologist, uh, who doesn't exactly say he's communist, but he's pretty close. And it was a very interesting kind of discussion slash date. Uh, there are many layers to what was going on there that maybe some other time I'll go into more detail on because a lot of it was very interesting. But he had advanced the idea that um, you know capitalism couldn't happen without slavery. Slavery was a necessary precondition that, that essentially created capitalism. Now, I've been reading a lot about the antebellum period of of the United of United States history. Uh, I read several books on Jackson, and actually, just when he'd asked this, I just read two books. Um, this one here, African Slavery in Latin America and the Caribbean, and also this one here. Time on the Cross, The Economics of American Negro Slavery. And there will be many more that I'll read. In fact, the entire, one of the ent entire shelves on one of those bookshelves is about American uh, chattel slavery in the South. Uh, and as it so happened then, I felt like I was in a good position to kind of respond to this. And my first initial kind of automatic response, one I would have had a long time before reading any of these books on the antebellum period, is the... The claim that slavery gave rise to capitalism or is what caused capitalism is uh, extremely implausible explanation because slavery has is something that has existed as long as there's been civilization, as long as we have history. If we're talking about ancient Mesopotamia or ancient uh, Egypt, uh, if we're talking about even hunter-gatherer societies, Neolithic societies, Mesolithic societies, you know, we don't have obviously historical records of ones thousands of years ago. I, I don't know if the anthropology can tell us if the Natufians uh, or the Nakata Three culture or whatever, if they had slaves or not. But among contemporary hunter-gatherer societies, it's actually rel relatively common. So the idea that slavery is this, since slavery has been this ubiquitous feature of human society um, up until very recently going as far back as that we, we know, the idea that it's an explanation for uh, something that occurred in you know around the 18th century or around 1800 in, in the UK and in 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 the Netherlands and a little bit later in the United States, the idea that that's the cause is a very very poor um, explanation. Um, you know if slavery is the cause of capitalism, then why didn't slavery begin in ancient Egypt or in Mesopotamia, and why didn't it begin in the third millennium BCE if not before? Why did it? you know, what? what's the reason for it to only begin uh, so much later? Now, I that was my initial kind of uh, reaction to, to his accusation. And his reply was, no, no, he doesn't just mean slavery generally. He means something, quote, very specific, the, the, North, the North Atlantic um, slave trade from Africa. Now, when we're talking about the Atlantic slave trade, um, we're talking about something that started in the 1450s before Columbus with the Portuguese. The Portuguese established trading posts um, on the west coast of Africa. Uh, and uh, initially they weren't going there for slaves. They were going there looking for routes to get around Africa to go to Asia, but also to trade for things like ivory and gold. Uh, and sometimes they would pick up some slaves as well. Now, after the development of the New World, or after it was dis discovered, um, the Spanish and the Portuguese decided to start to um, cultivate sugar uh, 
uh, in the New World. And sugar cultivation is something that had been utilizing slaves going back to the Crusades. Europeans had been trying to cultivate sugar in various places in the Mediterranean, uh, initially in the Levant after the end of the Crusades and the expulsion of the Christians from those lands, in places like Sicily and the Baroque Islands, uh, when the Spanish colonized the Canary Islands, uh, any place where they could, they tried to establish uh, sugar plantations. And with the uh, settlement of the Caribbean and South America and Central America, all of a sudden they found an area that this, they had a lot of potential to do this. And that's when the shift in, in the trade with Africa shifted away from, I mean, they still wanted gold and ivory by any means, but there became a much stronger emphasis, a much uh, better ability to uh, make profits by shipping humans labor from Africa to the Western Hemisphere. But we're starting, we're talking about something that starts in the in the 1450s, gets off in a big way in terms of explicitly looking for labor, you know, in the second, third decade of the 16th century, 1520, 1530, and it continues all the way until the slave trade itself goes up in, at least until the 1860s and probably illicitly at, until after, and actual slavery Chattel slavery continues into the late 1880s, I think 1888 in Brazil, um, in the Western Hemisphere, and it continues other places um, much later, including today. Um, and if we look, that's, that is over a 400-year time span. You're talking about a trade that is um, very much involving Europe, North America, South America, and Africa, although much of the trade, the biggest part of the trade was more directly South America to Africa without the so-called triangular leg going to Europe. Um, thank you, this book, for telling me that. Um, and so you're talking four continents, four hemispheres, the Eastern Hemisphere, the Western Hemisphere, the Southern Hemisphere, the Northern Hemisphere, the entire Atlantic Ocean, and 400 years plus. You know, he emphasized, well, I'm not, you know, you're, you're correct. If we looked at all the history of slavery, yes, so broad, then that wouldn't really explain me. He's talking about something very specific. A specific episode well that's not a very specific episode that is a broad brush that covers literally half the world and half a millennium that's about as unspecific as you can really get um, furthermore even if we say okay let's look at just the you know Atlantic slave trade if that's what causes capitalism it does not explain where it began because the biggest slave owners and the biggest slave traders were the Portuguese uh, in fact, another thing that I learned is that uh, none of the European states actually went and caught slaves, except for the Portuguese, and they didn't even do it very often. Um, in, in, without, I mean, the Spanish, all, all the European countries engaged in the slave trade. Uh, the English and the French and the Dutch quite extensively, the Portuguese even more. The Spanish didn't do the trade as much, although they owned slaves. Many, many slaves were imported to Spanish colonies. Um, but even people like the Danes and the Swedes and the Germans, they all engaged in the trade. Uh, but they weren't catching the slaves. The, the slaves were being caught in Africa by Africans and then sold on the market to Europeans, with, with a few exceptions with the Portuguese doing the catching. The Portuguese did the highest volume of trade. They owned the most slaves. They had them for the longest time. Uh, English were a major uh, component of that, obviously. English islands like Barbados and Jamaica uh, you know, they, they were large slaveholding areas, just as French places like uh, um, Guadeloupe, uh, Saint Domaine, which later became Haiti. Um, you know, uh, Spanish, the Spanish colonies uh, later, especially in Cuba, but uh, even initially in, in uh, New, New Spain, what became Mexico and Peru, uh, major, major consumers of slaves in Brazil. And so the idea is, okay, wait. If, if this is what's going to cause the Industrial Revolution and capitalism, why is it not starting in Brazil? Why isn't it starting in Lisbon? Why isn't it starting in Hispaniola? Why isn't it starting in Trinidad and Tobago? Why is it starting instead in, in England um, and, and, and uh, the Netherlands? Uh, and why is it starting 400 years almost, 350 years after you know the slate the trade begins the the biggest decade for the trade was definitely the 18th century and it's the end of the 18th century that we see uh the, the um the industrial revolution but again 
Mo most of the traders are the Portuguese. So why is it happening in Great Britain? Uh, if we look within the United States, uh, so there's been a there have been major shifts in where slavery was predominant. For the first 200 years, slavery predominated in the Chesapeake Bay and the Tidewater in Virginia and Maryland, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina. That was the area. This is before cotton had really picked up. You know, we're talking mostly rice farmers, tobacco farmers, domestic servants, that sort of thing. Small crafts, subsistence farming, not the big, almost pre-industrial agriculture that we saw later. With the uh, um, development of the cotton gin and cotton plantation, you see a major shift in the the uh, nexus or the center of gravity of the slave population, and it moves, it expands, and it moves into the so-called cotton belt, more in the deep south, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. Uh, it's fascinating, some fascinating maps that kind of show where this happened. Um, where did the Industrial Revolution happen in the United States? Well, it's actually a very specific place. I didn't realize this till I lived here for a while, but it was in Lowell, Massachusetts. The Merrimack River that flows through New Hampshire and then into northern Massachusetts is where all the first factories, all the first textile mills in the United States were. And I've been to some of these places. I've gone on dates. I've gone. I've met friends in some of these old textile mills that are now apartments in places like Lowell and Nashua. And fair enough, actually, right here in Manchester, a big part of downtown along the river are actually these old textile mills. Well, slavery was technically legal in both Massachusetts and in New Hampshire at some point, but it was v never very widely practiced, which is actually there's a, a whole other interesting topic to talk about the economics of slavery. Was it profitable and all that sort of thing? Um, the argument of this book, by the way, and of many others, is that it was, and I think that that's true, and that raises the interesting question, if it was so efficient and so so profitable, why did it exist in only some places, not others? It seems to have been very, very much wedded to certain types of agricultural regions, even though it was legal in other places. That's a, that's a whole other topic. But if it's slavery which causes the Industrial Revolution, then why did it not happen at least initially in Virginia and and Maryland, or not if not there later in say Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, Texas. Why did it start in Lowell, Massachusetts, of all places, and Nashua and Manchester, uh, places where slavery was never a big deal? It certainly was not a big deal when uh, you know by the time these mills were established in the 19th century. Uh, so it, to me, it's a very very poor explan explanation. Now. Uh, this type of argument is um, something that's addressed very explicitly in um, Deidre McCloskey's work, Bourgeoisie Dignity, where she's looking at um, put explanations for the cause of the Industrial Revolution. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I read the book several years ago, and I just thought that she, she must have addressed this because the entire point of that book is, did this cause it? Did this cause it? And sure enough, I went online. There is this chapter on slavery. And her argument is that there were several too, and I'm going to address the less important but more technical one first. And that is, if you look at, uh, well, I asked the sociologist, sociologist friend, you know, what what's the basis for this? Why why do you say that um, it was so vital? And he he uh, cited some research, and I don't remember the name, but if I do, I'll put it in the description uh, of a researcher who said, oh, investment from uh, slave holdings was really important to the initial capital investments in some of these uh, initial uh, big factories. And that was the main kind of uh, uh, argument. Uh, McCloskey seems to address that and say, uh, if we look at all foreign investment, not just sl the slave trade and trade generated by slave agriculture, that accounts for only a very small slice of the investment in total investment in, in capital ventures in, in the UK, uh, that any number of local industries accounted for bigger things, whether it's the wool industry or the coal industry or the brass industry she even brings up, you know, all these accounted for as big or bigger shares than quote unquote slavery. No one goes around saying it was, well, some people actually say that coal is responsible for the industrial revolution, but very few people go around and say, oh, it's the brass industry or the textile industry uh, or the woolen industry or the flax industry or just regular agriculture. Uh, in the UK, uh, yet for something that accounts for even smaller share of the uh, uh, industrial or initial capital investment, like slavery, and say, oh, no, no, this is what makes it so possible. Um, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. But even this, the larger meta argument, you know, you could look at the term capitalism and say, okay, capital, 
anything that creates capital is capitalism. But that's not what capitalism is because capitalism doesn't function by there just being capital available or capital existing. You don't just create capital and there ergo capitalism exists. If that's what is capitalism, then everything is capitalism. The Soviet Union had capitalism. You know, uh, every every society that has any capital whatsoever is capitalism. And capitalism, so broadly defined, exists everywhere, even in subsistence farming communities. Um, you know, you this is this is a parental problem that we have with a lot of our foreign aid is the idea is oh if we just give a country um capital stock then they'll be okay if we go to a third world country in africa and sub-saharan africa or in latin america and we just say here here's stuff here, uh then they're going to be okay then they're going to have free market capitalism but what really makes something capitalism is it's a process it's it's a it's an interaction it's a system it's not physical goods per se it's how those physical goods are utilized how they're managed, you know, that's sort of, you have to have the entrepreneurs, you have to have the private property, you have to have the arbitrage on, arbitrage on the market, uh, you know, prices, um, you know, profits to be made, losses to be had. That's what you need. And you need social attitudes that, that allow that to take place. Uh, and that's something that slavery didn't happen to help at all. Um, you know, uh, and even if we were to say, even if you could prove, and this is disputed, and you know, like he's citing a work that says that the investment from uh, slavery wasn't really important. McCloskey's citing work that's saying it's not. I, I'm going to be honest, and I didn't examine both of them, uh, you know, to to the point where I can refute. Now, I have great respect for McCloskey as a scholar, and her stuff is much more recent than the stuff he cited. The stuff he cited is from the 1940s. You know, I don't know what the econometrics, how good they were back then compared to today. Um, but let's, I, I think it's irrelevant because I could see the argument and say, let's just assume that there was a lot of investment that capital investment does not capitalism make. Okay. Because then the Soviet union had capitalism because the Soviet union had an, a large amount of capital. I mean, they started with a lot, they confiscated a great deal, and then they were able to get capital investment all the time from Western firms. They were able to leverage the resources within the Soviet union. Uh, and use them as a way to draw in foreign capital. They say, oh, look, we have these gold mines. Here, gold gold mining firm in, in Holland or the U.S. or Germany. Uh, we will give you a 35-year lease on the gold field or the oil field or the magnesium mine or the tungsten mine or whatever it was, uh, lumber mill, you name it. We'll give you a whatever 50-year lease, 25-year lease, 35-year lease. If you come and you develop the capital, you can then exploit it with exclusive rights for however, however long. And as soon as the companies would establish the initial investment and build up the factory and the infrastructure and train the personnel, most of the time, the Soviets would then kick them out of the country and basically nationalize it to one degree or another, uh, with a few exceptions that they kept kind of as tokens to say, oh, look, no, we'll, we'll treat you fine, or people, uh, people who own firms that were uh, politically connected and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but that doesn't make the Soviet Union capitalist. That doesn't mean you have capitalism in the Soviet Union. Just the fact that you plop down capital, you know, capital there, and the fact, assuming that it's true, and McCloskey is disputing this, and I'm gonna, I agree with, I'm just gonna, I'm biased or whatever, but like, um, you can't just say, well, some in, of the initial investment, and even even if you say a lot of the initial investment comes from slavery, there go you have capitalism. No, it doesn't really work that way. And if we're gonna talk at more of a meta level, and we're talking about like laissez-faire capitalism, um. Slavery is something that doesn't exist in laissez-faire. I mean, the, and these books are not by libertarians. Although I don't know about the authors about this, um, and I don't know about the authors about this. But these, these, none of these books are written in the vein of let's try and look at slavery through the prism of libertarianism versus not libertarianism debate. These are not questions they're dealing with. But in this book in particular, it says very frankly at the end, slavery can't exist without dramatic government intervention and if we read this book and there are people who dispute this book by the way and i have there's another one called uh time on the cross and the numbers game which are other economists who are kind of disputing what's written in this book and that's also sitting on my shelf uh but i don't think it's going to matter because the entire the, the system does not work unless you have state intervention making it work it, it, it's a system that cannot function without uh, dramatic and widespread, massive and deep government intervention, which of course not laissez-faire at all. Um, you know, and kind of my second counter is to his argument was, 
if it was so important to have it be started, how come capitalism did so well once slavery was abolished? Right. If it, if it's this germinating thing that you have to, you had to have it in order for capitalism to grow, how did it do so well once slavery was abolished? It seems very odd that it couldn't, you know, capitalism couldn't exist until slavery, you know, and not just slavery, which again, that's a that's a whole other interesting topic. Um, why is why is it so significant that it's not just slavery? but the Atlantic slave trade, right? Uh, you know, when I said, well, slavery has been around, you know, for millennia. So why didn't it give rise to capital? Oh, no, it's, it's very specific. It's the North Atlantic, you know, it's the Atlantic slave trade. Well, A, that's not specific. That's, a, again, half a millennium and for all four hemispheres, four continents, second largest ocean, even more than that, because they were actually transporting people in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. But whatever, let's not get too, you know, particular. Um, why is that significant? Why why would transport transporting millions of Gauls, you know, or or other Europeans into Italy in the second and third century BCE not cause industrialism and and not be something that's going to give rise to capitalism but doing so if we put them on a ship and take them across the ocean and there's a strong racial element to it um not nah. why would why would taking millions i mean the number of slaves taken by the arabs from europe from africa were, were larger than the number that the europeans took although albeit over maybe twice the span of years or maybe three times the span of years why is it that that would not give rise to capitalism but it would give rise to capitalism if Europeans did it uh, across the ships. And it's not clear to me why that's what the important distinction is there, other than I'm just going to ignore all the counter examples and say this is the only relevant example, but why is this the only relevant example? Never really explained. You know, we didn't want to argue too much. I was kind of curious about that. Um, so there's that element to it. Now, what I think was really going on here, though, is. Uh, there's just an attempt to 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 slander and to to um, guilt by association. Say, oh, this is bad. And at one point, you know, we were walking around through Boston, through Cambridge, uh, and he was like, you know, I just can't help but always feel guilty about all this stuff. Everything here is guilt. You know, everything here is, you know, built off of slavery. And I was like, where? Very few. I don't think there are any buildings in Boston right now that were built by slaves. Maybe I'm wrong. If there are, there can't be very many. Um, you know, if if there is some slice of the capital at some point, if you go back in the Genesis, and you can trace stuff back all the way to like the first Homo habilis tools, if you want. Yeah, I'm sure probably you're going to find some slavery back there. But how how relevant is that when you go that far back and add that many other things? But where where on earth are you going to find where there is a taintless slaveless history where you can't you can't go back and find something where there's a conquest or blood or or thievery i don't think there's anywhere that you can would he would this guy walk around in brazil for instance and say geez uh all this is wrong because if anything, Brazil had more slaves over a longer period and was more dependent on it than the United States ever was. Even 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 completely counting, even if we extrapolated and said the entire U.S. was like the entire South, it wouldn't really be that way. Um, no. Would you say this about Mexico? Now, I always used to think that there was no slavery in Mexico because in the immediate antebellum period, when like California joined the United States, when they were having debates about what how the states were going to be once they incorporated from Mexico, they said, oh, there's there's no slavery in those states. See, that was a new thing. Slavery had only been abolished gradually, gradually well, with the Mexican Revolution uh, in the 1820s. And there were still slaves in Mexico and probably until several decades later, up until the 1850s, if not even later. And this is actually the kind of the norm throughout the Spanish colonies in Latin America. Uh, most of them, once they became independent, enacted gradual emancipation, which would have continued throughout the 19th century, with the exception of a few colonies that remained, like Cuba. And slavery in Cuba lasted, slave trade lasted into the 1860s. Uh, the actual slavery in Cuba lasted until much later, I think the 70s or 80s. Uh, you know, would you go to Cuba and say, oh, everything here is tainted 
by uh, you know slavery's touch, even though the history of slavery there is much deeper and much more important economically and historically than it is in the United States. Uh, and I said, look, and and what about in Africa? I brought out because I had just recently read like it wasn't like the Africans were just prostrate to the Europeans coming and snatching away. The Africans were the ones doing the snatching and they were selling them. And when they made an exchange, they didn't say, I mean, they were getting manufactured goods. They were getting like literal capital tools, firearms, cloth, all this stuff, you know, money, gold, whatever, silver, um, you know, and they were making exchanges that they thought were fair. These weren't dictated, you know, uh, things where like the Europeans came and said, this is what it's going to be. These were market exchanges, you know, to the extent that you can call, you know, a transaction with a human channel of market exchange, you know, and the Africans were paid what they thought was fair. So would you go to Africa and say, well, you know, slavery, uh, the, all this is tainted by slavery. And it's no, it's, it's very, very selective and selective in a completely arbitrary and unbiased way. Um, you know, and, uh, a completely unfair way and to just be like, well, you know, rich countries today, they're completely tainted by slavery. But, uh, you know, uh, Arab countries, African countries, uh, South Asian countries, none of these countries, Latin American countries, none of these countries, you know, are, are guilty in any way, even though there no, there's no way to say that they are less culpable. None. There is no argument you can make that says that they are any less culpable. What's unique about slavery, and Thomas Sowell has pointed this out, many other people, the whole idea that slavery is wrong, the entire, con slavery was overwhelmingly, unanimously considered right by every society in, in history that we know, until we get to a couple Western, uh, almost industrial, post, um, post-Renaissance, post-Reformation, societies in the UK uh in in great in uh in in the Netherlands you get some of the Quakers some of the Anabaptists you know a couple of the others that start saying maybe this is wrong maybe this is a problem you know you don't get it in Africa it didn't start in Africa there weren't people in Africa going around saying this is wrong we should stop this there certainly weren't Arabs I mean uh Saudi Arabia didn't ban slavery until 1962 and the caliphate today in ISIS is perfectly complaining that it's perfectly legal because that's what Muhammad, you know, in all of his wisdom said is okay. And you know what? I single out Muhammad, but the Old Testament where there or the Talmud and the Bible and Jesus and all of them apparently thought slavery was just fine too. So it's only the, the one it's so ironic is the one society that actually came forward and said this is wrong. And it was a gradual thing, and there were other, there it wasn't a, a, it depends who we're talking about. A lot of times, you know, like the British were very selective in their outrage. You know, they banned slavery in the UK, but they allowed it to continue in their colonies that were dependent on it for many years later. And same thing happened in France. You know, slavery was outlawed in France, but it continued in Guadeloupe uh, and, and St. Croix and some of their other, well, not St. Croix, but some, some of their islands where it was really important to the economy for much longer. Um, you know, and, and their prosecution of the, of the slave trade through the Navy had other motivations besides, you know, sheer humanitarianism, but there were humanitarianism, you know, elements. And that was where the, the genesis was, if not always all the impetus. And this is close true in the United States as well. Um, and yet that's the society that's going to take all the blame, even though it can't possibly be any more blameworthy than any of the other societies. They just ran with it and did better with it. Yeah, they had slavery in Africa and it didn't give them a whole hell of a lot. And we had slavery here and it's kind of debatable how much it gave us, but we turned out a whole lot you know, better, at least in terms of materialism. I would argue in more senses than just materialism, but at least in that sense. So I think that the whole point, you know, the whole critique is, is an attempt to slur ideological enemies, to load with guilt, uh, very, very, very much a PC kind of thing. One that doesn't stand up to the least bit of historical scrutiny. Um, which is interesting. This guy, smart guy, he teaches at Harvard. He's not a full professor. He's a graduate student, but he actually fucking teaches classes there. He told me, uh, that he, um, passed his oral exams with quote, uh, high distinction, something that is very rare. Uh, motherfucker, uh, couldn't hold an argument though for 30 seconds on this issue. Um, and he was a sociologist and there was a whole other thing fascinating. 
you know, soci sociology is always singled out as like the most um, esoteric, the most insulated uh, discipline within universities that has the least um, connection with reality. Thomas Sowell in his book on intellectuals it, explicitly signals that I was like, it doesn't matter what their ideas are. And it was fascinating too, because he talked about in the process of writing recommendations for people that they would, even if a person knew all the information correctly, even if they, that in terms of memorization and understanding of the material, if they had the wrong ideology, they would um, qualify any recommendation, say, but this person has the wrong ideology, so and so. Interesting enough, he'd never heard of Thomas Sowell. I said, well, what about Thomas Sowell? You know, went to Harvard Black, wouldn't, you know, smart guy. No, nope, never heard of him. Uh, so, you know, he's definitely not reading the stuff that we're reading. And, you know, there's a whole other thing there about our own selective bias and all that kind of stuff. I don't want to make, I don't want to, you know, cast myself in the light of perfectly objective um, uh, consumer of pure wisdom. That's not true. But just, I, I, I think that it, it just, his arguments didn't stand up to any scrutiny whatsoever. Uh, but it's not that uncommon. I saw that it has been raised a couple times. There's a couple new books apparently out there that sort of run this argument. Uh, basically, say, oh, capitalism's evil, you know, blah, 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 slavery. Um, again, how, how something that is 100% dependent on state intervention, whether we're talking at the national or the state level, and in the case of slavery at both levels, um, not to mention municipal levels, you know, how that can be considered free market capitalism is a very good question. The idea that it created capitalism, again, the timing and the place doesn't really work. You know, uh, Manchester, England never really had tons of slaves, uh, just as Manchester, New Hampshire never really had tons of slaves, nor did Lowell, Massachusetts, even though those are explicitly the places where it began. Uh, you know, one of the arguments is that, well, the cheap cotton uh, is what gave rise to uh, capitalism. This doesn't even work because cotton culture didn't really start until the 19th century and the Industrial Revolution. Capitalism, as we know it, is at least 20 years before that, if not more. Also, many countries, it wasn't just the cotton that was cheaply, and it is true that the gang labor system of slavery produced cotton cheaper than it would have been produced in any other method at that time. There was no other me method to get it cheaper than that. Uh, free farmers could not produce cotton. That's, if anything, the main insight of, of this book here. And I recommend both of these books, by the way. Uh, both of them are fairly short and relatively engrossing. Um, but it wasn't like uh, that only the United Kingdom and, and uh, textile mills in Manchester paid lower prices for cotton because of slavery, right? Uh, everybody paid lower prices, prices for cotton. And uh, Don Boudreau actually wrote a, a little piece on this to the effect that one of the bigger importers, bigger than the UK even, was Russia. The, the Tsarist Russia was importing this cheap cotton as well, and yet they didn't have an industrial revolution as a result. You know, so again, the explanatory power is quite, quite poor. If everyone's getting cheaper cotton, why is the industrial revolution and capitalism starting in this place and not everywhere that has cheaper cotton? Good question. One that's not answered by by this critique. So. Anyway, I just thought that that would be an interesting kind of topic to go look at. I do want to make other videos. It's just I've been pretty busy. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of reading uh, about not just slavery, but the antebellum, antebellum period and some other things, too. I can't stay on the same thing constantly, but I do intersperse it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just thought it's been a while, so I'd throw that out there. All right. Have a good day, everyone.